Hello, everyone. My name is Jean-François Lamarck. I am the CIMIP panel chair, and I work at the National Center for Atmospheric Research in Boulder, Colorado, USA. I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk briefly about the Cobalt Model and the Comparison Project, CIMIP. The primary objective of the Cobalt Model and the Comparison Project is to better understand past, present, and future climate changes arising from both enforced variability, or also in response to changes in forcing. The key aspect to CIMIP is that it tried to do that in a multi-model context. CIMIP started in 1995. The, the first set of common experiments was a really specialized and idealized forcing in this case, constant rate of increase of CO2. But this is a really um, perfect example of the philosophy of CIMIP, of trying to uh, create common experiments that will shed light on the behavior of the climate system and in performed by a multi-model um, ensemble of groups all from all around the world. Since its inception in 1995, the role of CIMIP has grown um, exponentially. And it's really should be seen as both a scientific enterprise and as support for policymakers. In particular, CIMIP has played a critical role in supporting the IPCC assessment reports through data and papers from the CIMIP simulations. The most recent um, assessment reports from IPCC were released over the last few months. And in this figure is an example of the kind of information that CIMIP can help generate. It really um, is the only way we can identify the role of greenhouse gas versus natural causes versus aerosols in its combination of the evolution of, in this case, global surface temperature since 1850. What I would like to do is really also to put the research and the simulations and all the work that we do under CIMIP under the big picture of where we are now in terms of the climate state of the world. Um, based on the most recent analysis, we're about a, a degree and a quarter above pre-industrial. So we're getting really close within a few years, maximum a decade, from the threshold that was identified as with very significant increase in risk of a variety of significant impacts around the whole globe, which also created the 1.5 degree Paris um, Agreement. So, so now we are here and basically um, we're within a few years of reaching that. And so the, the research that we do has um, extreme relevance to decisions that policymakers would make over the next few years and decades. And in particular, what kind of future are we looking at uh, versus over the next few decades up to 2100? What kind of evolution of global temperature and its underlying changes in emissions are we going to see? What are we uh, willing to achieve to um, avoid 1.5 degrees or two degrees in temperature? And with that, I'd like to um, go into a little bit more detail on the approaches and the way we actually uh, get all this information generated. And I will pass um, to the, go to the next presentation uh, with Matt Mizelinski. Hi. I'm Matt Mizelinski from the Met Office Hadley Centre in the UK, and I'm the WGCM Infrastructure Panel Co-Chair alongside Paul Dirac. And I'm going to talk about how our client models have changed. So our client models have evolved a huge amount over the last three decades. In the early 90s, we saw the emergence of the first coupled models and the first intercomparison project with two rounds of the atmosphere model intercomparison project, the precursor to the first CIMP, which brought together client modeling groups from around the world. These models were crewed by modern standards, using coarse grids with around about 500 kilometer grid boxes where the Mediterranean is only a few pixels, and limited representations of our environment with few greenhouse gases and in many cases simplistic slab oceans. Through the 90s, the increases in computing power driven by Moore's law and the development effort invested in the models by our community have delivered greater resolution. Note the UK is now visible on the map of Europe and greater scientific complexity with the introduction of better ocean representations, volcanic activity and sulfate aerosols. By the turn of the century, we have both further improvement in model resolution, horizontally and in the vertical, and significant advances in the representation of key features of our climate, including the carbon cycle, 
atmospheric aerosols and the overturning circulation transporting energy from the equatorial oceans poles. These models have delivered results to the third round of CMIP and fed into the fourth IPCC assessment report. By the 2010s, the CMIP-5 class models have still greater scientific features with interactive vegetation, atmospheric chemistry, plus some ocean biogeochemistry. We now have a 100 kilometer grid resolutions given better fidelity in our climate data with particular improvements in our mountainous regions, such as around the Alps and the Mediterranean. In the latest round, CMIP-6, we've seen a number of significant steps. There have been further development in the science components with the representation of volcanic emissions, extension of ocean biogeochemistry, and the introduction of interactive ice sheets and glaciers in a few models. On top of this, we've seen the emergence of model resolution hierarchies, extending from the standard grids used in CMIP-5 to well below 40 kilometers, giving a better representation of local conditions, an important feature when investigating the impacts of regional climate change. These figures from the recent IPCC assessment report really illustrate how the models have evolved and how they could continue to do so. The increases in the horizontal and vertical resolutions of our models between CMIP-5 and CMIP-6, as shown on the left, have been modest, with few members of the ensemble switching higher. One of the CMIP-6 activities, Hires MIP, has focused on exploiting the power of our supercomputers by exploring the value of resolution in our simulations, looking at how the emergence of large-scale climate depends on the representation of fine-scale properties and has illustrated where our models could be heading in the future. On the right, this figure shows that the science within our models is also evolving, with both the number of models increasing as more groups get involved, we now have around 100 models involved in CMIP, and the complexity of our simulations also growing. We can see significant improvements through CMIP-5 and CMIP-6 in the increasing number of models that include a representation of aerosols, atmospheric chemistry and the nitrogen cycles, for example. Alongside these increases in resolution and complexity, we can also see steady progression in the performance of our models as measured by their results. There have been valuable improvements in a host of metrics, including precipitation, the balance of the radiation budget, circulation and the representation of the ecosystem. Now over to Paul. Thanks for the introduction, Matt. Hello and good afternoon. I hope you've been enjoying the symposium. My name is Paul Durack. Alongside Matt, I am the WCRP WGCM Infrastructural Panel Co-Chair and a CMIP panel member alongside JF. I'm based at the Program for Climate Model Diagnosis and Intercomparison at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory in California, USA. Thanks to the organizers for inviting us to talk about CMIP and to JF and Matt for providing the overview talks. JF noted that CMIP has provided a growing and increasingly more critical role in the IPCC assessment reports. You can see the first report, AR1, published in 1990 on the far left, and the latest, AR6, published in August 2021 on the far right. Matt has talked about how models have evolved over time, and you can see his timeline from previous slides reproduced below. I'm focused on the collective contributions of the complete AMIP and CMIP projects and how we can quantify these contributions. The total project size has heavily pushed computational limits of the time, growing from a single gigabyte for AMIP 1 in 1990 to 500 gigabytes for AMIP 2 in 1993. And as you can see on the, as you can see on the lower left-hand side, a single gigabyte was generated for the first CMIP 1 phase in 1995 growing to 500 gigawatts for CMIP-2 in the late 1990s, and then explosive growth occurred with 35 terabytes for CMIP-3 in 2007, and two petabytes for CMIP-5 in 2013. For CMIP-6, we're currently at 13 petabytes, with 23 petabytes in total, considering all the replicated data sets. You can see the explosive growth in this plot. In the early AMIP and CMIP phases, single experiments in blue underpinned the project design. In CMIP-3, science questions expanded the scope, extending to 12 experiments. 34 experiments comprise CMIP-5. CMIP-6 is the largest expansion to date with 24 sub-projects on MIPS, leading to 322 experiments, as you can see in blue on the far right. Alongside the increasing complexity, the project has received increasing international interest with 26 countries involved in the CMIP-6 in red, and an expansion from 24 to 59 to 144 models from CMIP-3 to CMIP-6 represented in orange. 
The, the internationalization of the project is evident in this map from the latest AR6 report. You can see that contributions extend across both hemispheres with many new centers in CMIP3 onward and some contributing to CMIP for the first time in CMIP6. Alongside the growth in contributing modeling groups, we've also seen a large growth in the computing infrastructure contributors that underpin the CMIP6 project delivery. In the early phases, prior to and including CMIP3, a single data store based at Peace and DI at Lawrence Livermore in California collated and archived the AMIP and the CMIP data sets. Towards the end of CMIP3, there was a recognition that CMIP was getting too big for a single data provider, pushing the limits of computation and storage. And this led to the establishment of the Earth System Grid Federation, or ESGF, as you can see down in the right-hand corner. The federated design of ESGF is depicted in the lower right schematic. The objective of ESGF is to coordinate CMIP data across the globe. CMIP5 had 41 nodes operating at its peak, and to date, CMIP6 has 29 nodes representing contributions from 17 countries around the globe. The, increase, the increasing internationalization of CMIP is evident in the map, which now, which now includes all models and infrastructure providers across the globe, in contrast to the map of just modeling data set uh, providers in AR6. We now have contributions from every continent except Antarctica, and our community continues to grow. This video shows the CMIP6 data growth since the initial publication in July 2018 across the 20 MIPS that comprise the CMIP6 project. The three IPCC Working Group 1 review deadlines, the first and the second order drafts, along with the final government draft as shown by the vertical red lines. You can see as this plot continues, even through 2022, the CMIP6 data resource continues to grow markedly. And this will be a core climate science resource for many years into the future. In summary, some core statistics for CMIP6 project to date. So as I noted before, there are 24 sub projects on MIPS that comprise CMIP6, which include 322 experiments and contributions from 52 institutions that represent 26 countries. We've got 144 registered models and we've got 23 petabytes of data, which is partitioned into both the unique and the replicated data sets as 13 and 10 petabytes um, respectively. There was a CMIP6 special in, in issue in Gene Scientific Model Development or GMD, which comprised 25 CMIP6 overview and MIP descriptive papers, 13 CMIP6 forcing data set descriptive papers, and five CMIP6 infrastructure overview papers which really summarized the project well. The airing at our 2016 CMIP6 overview, which was published in GMD, uh, has collected 3,100 citations to date, just over six years, which compares to uh, the Taylor at our CMIP5 contribution, which has received over 13,000 uh, citations in 10 years, and the Mill at our uh, 2007 publication, which documented CMIP3, which has received over 15 years the same amount that the airing and hours received over the last six. So in addition to CMIP, we continue to expand the MIP science and uh, delivery community. And we do this through a number of other projects in addition to CMIP. The input data sets for modeling the comparisons project aims to engage the forcing specialists across science domains, coordinating these key CMIP forcing data sets, not only CMIP six, but future forcing data sets as well. The aim is to collect, document, and centrally archive, leveraging the ESGF International Federation for data distribution and coordination. The observations or observed data sets for model and comparison, OBS for MIPS, aims to engage the broad observing community, which is far larger than the modeling community. We want to coordinate the observational data sets and then bring these observational data to the CMIP standards, again, leveraging ESGF for International Federation for Data Distribution and Coordination. Many thanks for listening and back over to you, JF. After this overview of CIMIP, how it, what it does and how it functions by Matt, Paul and myself, I'd like to spend a, a few uh, moments uh, thinking about where CIMIP will be going over the, the next few years. It is really clear that uh, changes in climate extremes, heat waves, flooding, you know, warming world will have impact on people's lives, um, especially 
large populations of uh, very uh, vulnerable individuals. And so there is, there is a huge need to um, address the demand for climate science and information and support those nations in addressing climate change and climate variability. And the example of the current heat wave over India and Pakistan is almost a poster child for what the future might look like as this Recent study, um, and as advertised here on this website, it indicates on the um, increased frequency of heat waves over the, this region from climate change. So um, there was a CIMIP International Project Office um, recently started. It is led by um, Eleanor O'Rourke and it's funded by ESA. And it, this, this office will play a key role enabling CIMIP to achieve its goals over the next few years. And it will be presentation by um, Eleanor and Suzanne on what this uh, project office will be doing. And with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Please contact any of us if you have any further questions on CIMIP. Thank you.